Here is a NumPy array of 128 numbers. But what if we can compress it to just two integers, and these two integers are enough to reconstruct the original array with near-perfect accuracy? Well, this technique is called residual vector quantization, and it allows you to store and transmit information very efficiently. My name is Bai, I'm a machine learning engineer and a PhD in natural language processing. And now let's dive into how this technique works. In this video, I will be focusing on applying residual vector quantization to audio and speech embeddings, but just know that there are other situations where this technique can be useful as well. For compressing audio embeddings, the Soundstream paper in 2021 introduced the idea of using residual vector quantization. But the Soundstream paper did not release any model weights or any code. So the Encodec paper came out a year later, it made some improvements to the model architecture, but more importantly, they released the model weights and an open source GitHub codebase. So Encodec is the only model that you can pick up and play with. So here we have the model architecture diagram of the Encodec model, and it is an encoder-decoder model. So it takes in a sample of audio that's a few milliseconds long and passes it through an encoder. This produces a vector that is 128 dimensions. And this vector then goes through the decoder to produce the reconstructed audio. I won't be talking too much about the other parts of the model in this video, but just this purple part here is the quantizer part. This is the part that does the residual vector quantization. So it takes in a sequence of audio frames that are encoded into these vectors. Uh, each one is 128 dimensions, and you get 75 of these every second. And you can think of these vectors as learned embeddings that represent the audio, so acoustic embeddings. And residual vector quantization is what we apply to these embeddings to make them smaller. You might have heard of quantization in machine learning. It is a commonly used technique to make models faster, smaller, and more efficient. I have a video here that goes into detail about how quantization works if you're interested. Quantization generally involves taking some data like vectors or model weights that's stored in some larger format like 32-bit float and converting it into something smaller like 8-bit integer. And in this case, going from 32 to 8 bits per parameter means you are saving 4x. There are some trade-offs, of course. You will expect to lose some accuracy, but since you are saving 4x in terms of model storage and inference costs, it might be worth it. And it is a widely used technique whenever you're trying to run a model on limited hardware that has no memory constraints. For example, if you're trying to run Llama models on your laptop, you will probably go for a quantized version of the model. But there are limits to how much you can quantize. If you have a vector full of 100 floating point numbers and you quantize all of them, you have integers, but you still have 100 integers. It is not able to get us to the original goal of turning this vector into a single number. And to do that, we will need to do something different called codebook quantization. But before we go into that, let me share something I've been working on. It is a tool to help you write things using voice. Simply speak your thoughts, and the AI will recognize your voice, add punctuation, and fix the grammar in real time. It uses state-of-the-art speech recognition AI, just like the models I'm describing in this video. I use it every day to write everything so much faster than if I'm writing it manually, including all my emails and my daily stand-up updates. Try it for free at voicewriter.io, link in the description. Now back to the video. Codebook quantization. Here we learn a set of possible vectors that cover the entire embedding space. And the idea is whenever we have a vector, let's say we have this point here, it gets associated with the closest vector in the codebook. And since there are a finite number of them, we can associate each one of these vectors with a number. We can think of these as index entries into a codebook. The codebook stores the vector that is represented by each of these codes. So once we have these set of vectors that are mapped to codes, then we can represent this vector here with a single number. And it is not very precise, so everything in this region here, it will get mapped to the number 2. But this is really space efficient, because if there are 8 codebook vectors, then it takes only 3 bits per vector to store, because log 8 is 3. 
If we are okay with this amount of quantization error and we find a way to store this codebook, then this is a very efficient way of storing this vector. Now we're ready to talk about residual vector quantization, the topic of this video. This codebook quantization step is not very precise, and there is a lot of error between the original vector and the codebook vector that we can represent. And the idea of residual vector quantization is the difference between the original and the codebook vector is a vector, and we can call this the residual vector. And since this error is a vector, we can learn another codebook and apply the codebook quantization step again to quantize this residual vector. I made this diagram smaller because each time the vector that we're trying to quantize is the residual, so the error in what is not covered in all of the previous steps. And in each step, we learn a new set of codebook vectors and the vector gets a new index. Let's say the first one we get index 2 and the second step we get index 7. Then this original vector can be represented using a list of numbers, 2 comma 7. And we can repeat this process as many times as we wish to get more and more precise and closer to representing the original vector. Here is another diagram that illustrates the same idea in a different way. So here we have the original vector in green. It goes through the first quantizer. Um, the nearest vector is the index 3. And this codebook vector is subtracted from the original vector to get the red vector, the first residual vector. In the second quantizer step, this residual vector, um, we look up the closest vector in the second codebook. Um, it has index 12 and we subtract it from this residual vector to get the second residual vector in blue. And in the third step, we do the process again with the second residual vector, and so on. So at the end, we end up with this list of numbers, where each of the numbers represents the index into one of the quantizers. And the more times we do this, the closer we get to representing the original vector. Here is the pseudocode of this algorithm taken from the Soundstream paper. We have this parameter mq, which denotes how many iterations to apply the algorithm. And in each step of the algorithm, we take the residual and apply the quantizer to it, which means getting the closest vector to it. And we subtract it from the current vector to get the new residual. The first few iterations capture the most important information about the vector, and subsequent iterations become more and more accurate. So the number of iterations determines the trade-off between the vector size and quality. In the encoder model, the number of iterations we apply residual vector quantization determines the bit rate. The number of iterations can be anywhere from 2, 4, 8, 16, or 32, which means the bit rate can be 1.5, 3, 6, 12, or 24 kilobits per second. And this chart from the paper shows how the bit rate affects the quality score. So it seems that once you get below 6 kilobits per second, the quality score starts to degrade significantly. Let's do some quick math to see how the number of iterations and the bit rate matches up. So the encoder model produces 75 frames per second, and each frame gets transformed into an audio vector. Let's say we are using the most aggressive compression possible, so we are only doing two the iterations of residual vector quantization. This means that a vector corresponds to two codebook indices. And in this model, there are 1024 codebook entries, so it takes 10 bits of information to represent one entry. Multiplying everything together, we get 1500 bits per second, or 1.5 kilobits per second. Now let's actually hear what this sounds like. I've recorded a short sample of myself talking, and here's the original MP3. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Now let's hear what it sounds like after going through the encoder model. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. So I think I can definitely hear some artifacts when the bitrate is too low, like 1.5 or 3 kilobits per second, 
but once you get to 6 kilobits per second, it sounds pretty similar to the original MP3. So 8 rounds of quantization in this model, and 6 kilobits per second is pretty good. And just for comparison, in the MP3 file format, usually the minimum bitrate is somewhere around 96 kilobits per second. So that's around 10 or 15 times more to achieve an acceptable quality most of the time. The last topic I'm going to cover in this video is how do you learn these codebook vectors? Like you need to assign these indices to these vectors, but where should you put these vectors in a way that's optimal? And this is quite interesting, um, because first if you have the encoder already, that's already trained, then the most straightforward way is to use something like k-means clustering. And this is a classic machine learning algorithm where if you have a set of points and you have another k, then it can learn optimally the optimal way of putting these k centroids so that the distance from a random point to a centroid is as small as possible. And in fact, the encodec paper does this as a first step, but we can do more than k-means. What works better is if we learn the model and the quantizers at the same time. So I didn't really talk about how this model is trained, but you can imagine some kind of training loop where they feed it a bunch of data and the model learns through the data. And at the same time, while you're doing this, you're learning the quantizers, like the codebook vectors and the mapping between the indices and the code vectors. And there are two parts to this. The first is the codebook update. So imagine you have a vector here that's produced by the encoder, vector v. And during quantization, it gets mapped to the closest codebook vector, so this one here. The codebook update means that this codebook vector is pushed slightly towards the embedding vector. And this is done using an exponential moving average with a decay. So ci um, is the original codebook vector, and it gets decayed by some amount like 0.99 and it, this equation moves it towards the vector v to get the new uh, codebook vector that we use in the next iteration. The second part is the commitment loss. So this is a loss that is applied to the encoder to encourage it to produce vectors that are close to the codebook vectors. So if the encoder produces like a vector that's way out here, then whatever distance it is between this vector and the closest codebook vector, gets penalized as part of the loss function. So this encourages the encoder to produce vectors that are already part of the codebook. And the combination of this commitment loss with the codebook update means that both the encoder and the codebook vectors are trying to move closer to each other during the training process. And a final strategy that helps is random restarts. So imagine if the encoder produces a whole bunch of vectors like around, around here, and some codebook vectors might exist here, but they're never used. Its encoder never produces something that is close enough to it. Um, in this case, we just kill it and put it somewhere else that the encoder is already producing a vector. And yeah, that's how we learn the codebook vectors. Um, that's it for this video, and I hope you found it helpful. All of this is exciting technology that will probably be used in the near future for streaming your music and whatnot. If you want to play with this, the encoder model is open source and it's fairly easy to get up and running. And one last thing, if you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to my channel to help it grow. And please leave a comment if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos. Uh, that's it. See you.